is so cool. And there's one that has this, we as sopranos absolutely love because it hits a high G in the end of it. And it's just fun because it's big and all the guys sing it and my husband stands there and goes, I'm not a king. <laughs>
Before that, when we look at the Hebrew in the interliterary Bible, which is where you take Hebrew and the direct translation so it doesn't make any kind of sentence sense, you still have let us. And we, as Christians, followers of Jesus, we believe this is the beginning of our understanding of the Trinity. That the Trinity God the Father, Creator, God the Son, and Jesus Christ. We hear John 1 in that. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was made flesh. And then we have these words from Proverbs. Wisdom, referred with female pronouns, always. And we heard Julie read them for us this morning. It continues to help us understand this idea of the Trinity that it has been present from the beginning. That it, upon Jesus' ascension, he gave the new leaders something different. The power of the Holy Spirit. Proverbs gives us this rich, rich imagery of the Spirit being present with God the Creator. Verse 22, the Lord created me at the beginning of his way, before his deeds long in the past. I was formed in ancient times at the beginning before the earth was. And I don't know, I, I find it interesting that the comment part of the Trinity is also the spirit. Here, verse 30 and 31. I was beside him at a, as a master of crafts. I was having fun, smiling before him at all times, frolicking, I love that word, frolicking with his inhabitants, inhabited earth, and delighting in the human race. But this understanding of the Trinity wasn't something that was easily created. There were great battles over this idea, three and one and one and three. But Paul begins pulling it together long before the councils decide how to put it down on paper. Paul reminds us we have peace through God, with God through Christ. That's where it starts. I remember I was working for an international children's and youth organization, and we had a teaching tool, and it was a, a big chasm. There was no bottom. We were over here, and God was over here, and there was no way to bridge it. Then we talked about how Jesus was that bridge. That we, only through Christ, could get to the other side. We're not the children of Israel that have a covenant with God from the time of Abraham. We're adopted. We're adopted through Jesus Christ. Each and every one of us are first generation Christians. The cross is laid across the chasm. And we can cross it. And we can be at peace, as Paul says. At one with God. Through Jesus. And then Paul says, we have access by faith into the grace in which we stand through him. We can't do it without Jesus. Created from the beginning, with God and in God, bringing us into the fold. And then Paul goes on to remind us that we're not alone. And God is with us through the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the difficult part. We're to take pride in our problems. Because we know that trouble produces endurance. Endurance produces character, and character produces hope. This hope doesn't put us to shame. Because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Do you remember a few weeks ago, I talked about something called the prosperity gospel? It's that cultural theology that's 
that's really popular. People like um, Gloria and Kenneth uh, Copeland or Joel Osteen or lots of others. It, its premise is that God only wants what's good for us, and all we have to do is ask, and God will give it to us. Prosperity gospel, you know, some of those preachers will send you a billfold and say, if you just pray hard enough, I'll make sure that God gets you money. And people fall for it all the time. Or if you're suffering, it must be unrepentant sin or possession by a demon. Suffering just doesn't happen to those who love Jesus enough, is their cry. Preachers of the prosperity gospel seem to think that life is a puzzle that can be solved with an equal equation. Yet Paul tells us differently. Paul tells us we will suffer. We will have pain. Yet, we can grow through those struggles. Remember when I said that my mom thought this was Romans passage was the easy passage? And I think I know why. Because it's our story. We all suffer. I could stand up here and tell you all the sufferings I've gone through in my life, but you don't need to know them because you've got your own. I could ask every one of you. How have you suffered in your life, little or big? It's there. But suffering produces endurance. And endurance ultimately hope. We're always in relationship with God. If we remember who and whose we are. Today is Father's Day. And many of us can look to a father or a grandfather or an uncle or a father figure who was instrumental in making us who we are. A lot of times we talk about the women in our lives that were influential because, you know, most of the time it was the women who taught Sunday school or directed the choir or played the piano. There are also great men of faith who helped shape us into who we are. And it was about 22 years ago that my grandfather, Reverend J.D. Montai, passed away. And he and I both loved Jesus. But we disagreed big time in theology. I'd leave his house. I was his favorite grandchild, by the way. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. He made no bones about it. There were two guest rooms in their house. One permanently was called mine. Oh. I was the favorite. But that's okay. I was really their favorite because I lived closest to them and I saw them the most. But he, I would get in my car, about to get in my car, and he said, Carol, the blood of Jesus on your car. And I'd say, and the grace of God too, Grandpa. just, that was our banter back and forth. I remember we rode to, um, back from Mobile, Alabama one time. And it was just when um, seatbelt laws were coming into play. And we sat there for like four hours debating each side of the seatbelt law. My grandmother finally said, will the two of you please be quiet? <laughs> the thing was, he always wore a seatbelt anyway. But we had fun. That was who we were. But I remember in the last few weeks of his life, people would come and sit at his feet and hear how his troubles had produced endurance, endurance, character, and character hope. See, some of those people wanted my grandfather to just simply claim healing, and it would come, and the cancer would be gone. To live that equalized. If you do this enough, this is going to happen. And my grandfather said no. He 
instead knew that suffering was a part of his earthly life. And he also knew that God would continue to use him, even those last few weeks. Whether it was just days before his death and all of a sudden he was awake and he wanted to leave family Bible study. Sure enough, everybody in the house gathered around. Or it was the last moments as we stood at his bedside and all my life, he had always said he was going to see Jesus. He was going to see Jesus before he died. And as you can imagine, we were singing. And we were singing the, the hymn, Blessed Assurance, which is why I rarely sing Blessed Assurance, because I'm going to finish the story and we will all know why. When we got to that second verse. Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending ring from above. Echoes of mercy and whispers of love. And his eyes were open, and he was seeing Jesus. His conviction that he would see Jesus before he died truly came true that night. And he was trying to tell us all about it, and he was... His hands were up, his hands had moved in ours. And was seeing Jesus. We didn't agree on lots of things theologically. But we loved Jesus. And we loved each other. Father's Day this year lands on this Trinity Sunday in the midst of the complexity of that understanding, three and one and one and three. But I want you to know you're never alone. And today on this Father's Day, I want you to take a few moments to remember those men in your life. It might have been a preacher who stood in the pulpit. It might have been a choir director or organist or a youth leader or whoever it was. I want you to know I want you to take a moment and say thank you to them. Maybe they're still around, but for most of us, they're no longer on this, this earthly plane. But I'm thankful. I'm thankful that from the beginning of time, the Trinity was present, that Jesus brings us into right relationship with God and the Holy Spirit shares the love of God with us. I am so thankful. Don't get caught up on easy answers because they're often. To grow in our faith, what does it say? Trouble. Paul lived his entire ministry with a thorn in his eye. He asked always to have it removed, but it never happened according to the scripture. We have no proof that it was ever removed. The gift of the Trinity is that we're never alone, even in the midst of the complexity of our faith. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, we thank you for the men in our lives. Sons, husbands, fathers, grandfathers.